Hi everyone, I'm Terry Hatch with Discovery Education and we are here at Olson Field at the beautiful Blue Bell Park at Texas A&M University and we have a very exciting Science of Soil virtual field trip for you today. So why don't you follow me inside? Let's play ball. So I bet a lot of you play baseball or softball or if not you've seen a game but you might not have thought about the impact that the field has on the game itself. So today, we're gonna learn what it takes to maintain a beautiful turf grass field so that it's not only pristine, but it's safe for the athletes who play on it. So let's go down to the infield and hear from the man who makes it happen, Nick Whitney. Well, hi, Terry. Hello. Welcome to Olson Field at Bluebell Park at Texas A&M. Thank you, this is gorgeous. Thank you. We've got a uh, dedicated team that uh, works to try and ensure our fields are all looking this way year round. All right, well, let's find out more about that. Great. Hello, now I am here with the man who makes all of the magic happen. Nick McKenna is the Assistant Athletic Field Director here at Texas A&M University. Hello. Howdy, everyone. Thank you so much for having us here. We're gonna hear all about his job. We're gonna learn what an assistant athletic field manager does all day. But first, we've got a poll that we would like everybody to participate in. So you've probably seen a gorgeous field with a beautiful design sort of etched into it. Um, almost looks like an illustration. And if you've seen one of those, you've probably wondered how they do it. So we wanna hear what you think how they create these beautiful designs, and then we'll tell you the actual answer a little bit later. So head to our Twitter handle, at, it's at Discovery Ed, and you can um, take the poll there. Your choices are, is it created using different mowing heights on a riding mower? Is it created using different types of mowers? Is it created using different rates of fertilizer so that the grass is different colors? or is it created by hand using brooms and rollers? So tell us what you think, and we'll check back in a little bit later, but I'm guessing that's a question that you see a lot. That's probably the top question I get. Everybody always wants to know, how do you make the patterns? How do you make the logos? Yeah. So probably the top question we get. Yeah, well, speaking of questions, I'm hoping that the students have a lot of questions for you as well. So please remember that you can ask all of your questions um, by either using the question entry box right under your video player at thescienceofsoil.com or you can tweet them to us using hashtag scienceofsoilvft and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can. I mean, Nick's job is incredible. He basically gets to play on athletic fields all day long. So let us know what you wanna know from him. Um, but let's get down to it. We're talking about these beautiful turf grass fields and you are the one who's in charge of making sure that they not only look pristine but they're safe for the athletes that play on them every day Correct. and so since we're talking about real natural grass turf we're not talking about you know synth synthetic turf I'm sure that it all starts with the soil right absolutely Terry so as you said we're dealing with natural grass playing surfaces mm -hmm. here so basically to get that we're dealing with millions and millions of plants that are all growing together to create a field so obviously to have a healthy plant, we have to have a healthy soil. So it all starts with the soil, just like you said. Now, if you look on our right here, we have a kind of a brief model drawn up or, or put together of kind of what our fields are built like here at Texas A&M. One of the unique features we have is that all of our fields are actually grown on 100% sand. Um, we do that for a number of reasons. First and foremost is so that they'll drain, um, so that regardless of the weather that we have, we're still able to have our athletic events. Now with that, there comes some challenges as far as management, and nutrients and water, and we'll kind of address those a little bit here later in the show. Um, but yeah, so it all starts with the soil. If our soil is right, then the, plant, then the plant can be right. If the plant's right, the field's gonna be right. And if the field's right, then the athletic event is gonna go off without any problems. Mm -hmm. So one of the great things we have at Texas A&M here is we have a soil laboratory right here on campus that we're able to utilize on a daily basis or as needed. Um, so I can periodically, I'll come out here on the field, I'll pull samples from various locations all over the field, mix those together, put them into a bag or a box, and I run them out to our field lab, mm -hmm. or to our soil lab, where they can then take that sample and they'll analyze it for me. And they'll do a series of tests. The scientists out there are very intelligent. They're really good at what they do. They'll run a series of tests on that soil sample and they'll test it and they'll send a report back to me. And that report will detail all the different nutrients that are in our soil and then they'll make recommendations to me on what type of nutrients I need to apply, mm -hmm. how much I should apply, and when I should apply them. Mm -hmm. So we're very fortunate to have that. 
uh, Tony Proven, who is the director of the soil laboratory out there, has a tremendous background in soil science. He's got a bachelor's degree in agronomy, a master's degree in soil fertility, and a PhD in soil chemistry. So we're extremely fortunate to have somebody that qualified to help us in our daily management decisions that we make out here on the fields. Yeah, and so you sent a soil sample to Tony. So let's go to him to hear what that soil testing process looks like. Hey, Nick. Hey, Tony. Uh, looks like I missed all the fun. Yep, just wrapping up. I think this should be the last one I need to give you the amount I of soil. I brought a sample bag. Let's Perfect. go ahead and put it in there. Um, well, that gives us plenty there for the laboratory. Perfect. All right. I'll get this off the lab, get the results to you soon. Thanks, Tony. I appreciate sure thing. it. Now you're in our soil lab. We've already gotten Nick's sample uh, processed. And what Dale behind me is doing is the soil pH. He's already done the electrical conductivity. What we do is we take one part soil, two parts of water, add that to it, make up a little slurry, allow it to equilibrate. Dale takes electrical, uh, the conductivity meter a probe, measures the electrical conductivity, measurement of salts. Too much salts become a bad thing for our uh, turf grass uh, managers and landscape managers. Nick might have mentioned that they have some real problems with high pH, uh, particularly in the sand-based fields reduces root development and nutrient availability. We also have a problem here in Texas as well as across the country of low pH. How much limestone do we need to add to bring that pH up to the proper level so root development and nutrient availability is at its optimal standpoint? Two other tests that we run are nitrate nitrogen and the Malik 3. What they do is they uh, extract out the, the plant nutrients that we're ultimately going to analyze on our ICP OESs. What Sanders has done is he's added the extraction, the Malik 3 extraction solution, and we shake uh, this for five minutes. What this does is it helps uh, speed up the, uh, the extraction of that phosphorus, potassium, calcium, magnesium, sodium, and sulfur, gets it into solution. Kind of fun to watch, but here in a couple minutes, uh, he's gonna shut the shaker off, and then he's going to take tray by tray, 10 samples at a time, and he's going to pour them into uh, these filter papers that are on top of similar plastic cups. Well now Sanders has poured up uh, 60 samples, Nick's uh, sample is in there, and he'll wait for these to uh, slowly filter down through. They're filtering fairly fast today, uh, aren't they Sanders? Yes sir. Uh, it's because these are a little sandier soils. The heavy clay soils we have are going to filter uh, much slower. The next step will be after the filter, he'll remove the filter papers, those are disposed of, and then transfer the samples into the test tubes right here. Once they're uh, transferred into that, we'll be taking Nick's samples and uh, other client samples down to the ICP for analysis. Thank you, Sanders. Well, we're now in our instrument lab, and we've taken Nick's sample, we already got it on the auto sampler, this instrument that's in front of us is an ICP OES. And what that stands for, that acronym, is Inductively Coupled Plasma Optical Emission Spectrophotometer. And what it does is we take the auto sampler, it's pumped up into this peristaltic pump, and ultimately the solution, Nick's sample, is put into the spray chamber through a nebulizer. We make a microfine mist. That mist is then transferred in pure argon into a plasma. Plasma in this case is 10,000 degrees uh, Kelvin, super hot. So when Nick's sample hits that plasma, the elements that we're interested in, in fact, all elements, but the ones we're really interested in that we're measuring, phosphorus, potassium, calcium, magnesium, sulfur, and sodium, they hit that plasma and their outer electrons get thrown out. Then they continue in the plasma into a cooler part of the plasma, and then they come back in. And when they come back in, they give off photons of light unique photons of light that this portion of the instrument, a super sensitive optics bench, analyzes each one of those. Where the computer takes that data and it compares it to the standards and then it says we have this concentration of each one of these elements. Once we have that, we couple it with the uh, pH and conductivity information we already have, the nitrate nitrogen uh, we already uh, uh, determined. We put that together in a report and then I get that report to Nick.
right, welcome back. We are joined by another special guest. Kirsten Burnett is a senior here in the turf science, man, or <laughs> turf, what is it? Turf grass, turf grass science. science program at Texas A&M University. So why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Clearly you know a lot more about that than I do. Yeah, so I started working on all the athletic fields at A&M about four years ago. Mm -hmm. And so I never felt like I was at work when I went to work and I felt like that was a pretty good indication that maybe I should get a job there. And so um, I added a double major in turf grass science and now I'm geared up to graduate in May. So That's excellent. Well, Kirsten's going to show us everything that she's learning in classes and with this excellent hands-on experience <laughs> in just a little bit. But first, I want to go back to those soil samples that we were just seeing. So we actually have the results here. Can you just talk to us a little bit about the data that you're seeing and what that means for your job? Yeah, so we sent that soil test, uh, the soil sample over to Tony. He ran it through all their machines and mm -hmm. gave us, sent the results back. Um, and so what we're looking at, this is pretty typical for what we see with our fields here at Texas A&M being on a sand base. Um, there's some common nutrients that we're usually a little deficient in. Um, so when we look at these results, the first thing that jumps out to our mind is that we're low on nitrate, nitrogen. Um, very common in the sand because it doesn't hold on to that mm. that, cat, that anion very well or cation very well. Um, the second one is the potassium. So nitrogen and potassium, it's very common in our sand-based fields that we're low on those nutrients. So that's why we're constantly putting out a very light rate, frequent quantity, like we're frequently going out with very light rates just to slowly spoon feed the plant, just mm. to make sure it's always there and available for the plant. The other thing that I kind of always check on is the sodium levels, just because of our water quality that we have here. Sometimes we're fighting sodium levels that build up in the soil. Not an issue with this soil test, so it doesn't concern me here. And then the very last thing that we really focus on with these results is that pH number. Mm. Um, there's kind of an ideal range we're looking for. This one came back a little bit high. It's showing a pH of 8.3. So there's some steps that we'll probably take with our fertility plan and what we put out as far as trying to manage our pH and bring that back down a little bit. Great. And so you and Tony both mentioned that the way that you manage the nutrients is going to be a little bit different on a sandier soil because a sand-based soil like the one you have here on your turf fields is going to percolate more quickly. Is that correct? Absolutely correct. So Kirsten is actually going to show us a demonstration of that, a hands-on activity to show us why that is the case. But she's got some students to help her out. She really doesn't need us. <laughs> so let's just leave it to the pros. We'll be All back right. in a bit. Awesome, thank you guys so much for joining me. I definitely could not do this without your help. So if you could just introduce you guys for me. I'm Miriam from Kingwood. I'm Greg from Kingwood. I'm Gerardo from Kingwood. Awesome, so the first thing that we're gonna talk about is um, the minerals and the different particle sizes. So soil is composed of sand, silt, and clay. And so here to represent our sand, we have cereal, and to represent silt, we have some granola, and then we have oatmeal to represent our clay, which is the smallest particle size. So if y'all can take the cups that are in front of you, and I want you to pour up to the line um, each of your particles in there, please. And after this, we're gonna pour some water in there, and we're gonna have a race to see how fast the water moves through each of these different particle sizes. That's awesome. Okay, who do you think's gonna win this race? The tricks. Me. You think you're gonna win? Definitely I love the confidence. Me. All right, let's see <laughs> if you're gonna be the winner. So take your water, and on the count of three, I want you to slowly pour it in. Or go now. He's just so eager. Oh, I thought. No, you're Oops. good. You let me start. Uh, I mean, it's not, it doesn't really matter. So as you can see, it's not going through the oatmeal very fast at all and it is starting to get through the tricks a little bit faster and so that's because the sand particles are larger which means that there's more space in between each individual particle which means the pore space is bigger therefore the water is going to flow through sand a lot faster than it would silt or clay and so here on a and like Nick was saying we do have sand based fields so we need to keep that in mind when we're applying fertilizer because um, we don't want the nutrients to go through with our water, so we apply at a, a lower, more frequent rate so that our plants can take that um, nutrients up. And another thing to keep in mind for nutrients is the charge that our soil has. And so we're gonna do another experiment to show that. We're gonna show that soil acts like a filter. So if I can get you, Marion, to please pour this dirty water and we're gonna see how soil acts as a filter. Now, 
Do you think it's going to come out dirty like that, or do you think we're going to have clear water? Um, clear. Clear? Okay. Let's see if you're right. So it might take a couple minutes for it to drain properly, so we uh, set some stuff up earlier. So this is it after it had drained for a few minutes, and as you can see, that water is clear, and that's just because our soil acts like a filter, and it's gonna filter all of that out, and we're just gonna have clear water. And so another thing that soil does, it is charged. So um, to show that, we are going to take this um, purple drink powder, and if you can just mix up some water in there, you don't have to pour the whole thing in there, but just swirl it around for me, and we're gonna pour it in here as well. And we wanna see what is gonna come out, if we're gonna have clear water, if we're gonna have purple water, if we're gonna have something else. So what do you guys think that we're gonna have? We're gonna have clear water. Clear water, you think again? Clear water. Okay, let's see if uh, we got clear water. One? Yes, pour it in there. Awesome, so again, it might take a few minutes, so we sped up the process. And it actually came out to this pinkish color. That's because your soil is charged, and so like charges will attract and opposite charges will repel. And so in our soil, it attracted the blue dye, and so the blue stayed while the red dye went through. And so that's important for our nutrients that we want to understand our soil so that we can know what nutrients to have in it. And so I know that y'all had prepared a few questions. So if Nick and Terry can come join us real quick, we'll get to those. All right, Miriam. All right, so Abby Mann from Serrano Elementary, California, wants to know what kind of degree should I think about getting if I want to be a turf manager? Okay, so it really depends on what school that you're going to because every school has a different major or department that you can go into. For instance, here at Texas A&M, I am a soil crop science with an emphasis in turf grass science. And so it's going to be different wherever you go, um, but you can do anything from agronomy to horticulture to um, plant science. There's just so many different things that you can do if you want to go into this industry. Uh, this is from Daryl Thomas of Weedern Rockin Rockingham Middle School in Madison, North Carolina. Uh, wants to know, how have, how have playing fields changed over the years in college? I'll take that one. Um, Daryl, to answer your question is there's kind of two main things I'd really focus on as, as far as how fields have changed in the management of over in college. Uh, the first one I would say is if you went back and watched a college football game from 15 or 20 years ago, you would probably, and it was a rainy game, you'd probably see them playing in the mud essentially. Um, back then, you know, college athletic fields, especially football fields, you just built the field on whatever soil was there wherever you wanted to build your field at. So it was whatever native soil was there already. You planted the grass, put the grass down, and then you played, played ball. The change we've seen is like what we do here at Texas A&M now where we do a modified soil or we rip all that natural soil out and we put sand back in to ensure that it'll drain and so that it's not a muddy field when we're playing in the game and creates a better environment for the game to occur um, so there's less chance of affecting that with the field. Uh, the second thing I'll say that we've really seen over the last probably 10 to 15 years is that we've incorporated a lot more science into how we manage the fields. Um, back in the day, athletic field management used to be considered more of an art than a science, uh, where it was just kind of a touch and feel and you learned it as you went. Well, now we have a lot more analytical tools that we can put to use. Uh, for example, I talked about the soil laboratory earlier and how we can analyze what nutrients are in our soil and use that to make management decisions. So we've got tools like that and other instruments that we can use to test how hard a field is and how good the traction is and how much water it's holding. Um, so we're able to put a lot more numbers and use scientific data to really gauge what we're doing on a daily basis and how we manage the fields. Angelica Fleming from Snelson Golden Middle School in Hinesville, Georgia asks, is there a certain type of species of grass that is best for football fields only? Great question, Angelica. So I'll answer that one as well. Um, there's not really one specific type that's going to universally work across the board. A lot of it's actually geographically based. So depending on where you live in the country will dictate what grasses are being used and why. So there's two main types of turf grasses or grasses that exist in the world. And they're called cool season grasses and warm season grasses. And it's all about the climate that they prefer, whether it's cooler temperatures or warmer temperatures in which they grow best in. So if I get up to the north, in New York, the California, or Northern California, Iowa, 
um, kind of that northern climate, that's where we're going to grow the cool season turf grass species. So most of their football fields or athletic fields are probably going to be on something like a Kentucky bluegrass, a tall fescue, another fescue type species, maybe a ryegrass. Um, that's very common in the north. Now when we come down here into the south, into Texas, Florida, Georgia, Southern California, we use the worm season turf grasses. Um, and probably the most predominant one that gets used on athletic fields is Bermuda grass. Now there's different types, common Bermuda grass, hybrid Bermuda grass, um, but they're all Bermuda grasses at their, at their base. So those are kind of the common ones. Well guys, thank you for sharing those questions with us. And thank you so much for your time, Miriam, Greg, Geraldo. Thank you so much. And um, we're really, really happy to have you, Kirsten, here helping us um, and, you know, I hate to say it, Nick, but I kind of think she might have your job someday. I think she's gotten it for me. She's, she's on the way. So. She's on the way. <laughs> but speaking of your job, uh, I got a chance to sit down with you a little bit more earlier and hear what a turf field manager does all day. And so let's hear what you had to say. Great. My name is Nick McKenna. I am the Assistant Athletic Field Manager for the Texas A&M Athletic Department. Part of my role is that I'm jointly responsible for the care and maintenance of all of our athletic fields that our teams compete on. We do all of the maintenance for the grass playing surfaces, whether that's the mowing, the fertilizing, the watering. For Kyle Field, for example, we do all the painting of the lines and the logos for games. Um, my primary responsibility is to make sure that our grass playing surface is safe for our athletes to use on a daily basis. As a secondary level to that, obviously, um, part of our job revolves around the fan experience. So we're trying to provide this amazing, aesthetically visual appealing athletic surface. It's a balance of those two things, the safety of the field and the appearance of the field all coming together. Soil science plays a very, very important role in my job and what we do. If our soil isn't right, our plant can't be right. And if our plant can't be right, the field can't be right. We have a unique feature here at Texas A&M with all of our athletic fields, is that because of the importance of the events that we host, like the games have to be able to occur regardless of the weather that is happening. So due to that, all of our fields are actually built and grown on a sand root zone. All of our fields have actually been amended where all that natural soil was removed and we have come in and we've built in an internal drainage system so that if we get three inches of rain the night before a football game or the night before a baseball game, we can still host the event without having to worry because it's designed to drain that water internally. So we have anywhere usually between 10 to 12 inches of pure sand and then we put our grass plant on top of that. With all of our fields being grown on a sand-based medium, they don't hold nutrients as well as say like a native soil clay uh, that you might find in a, in a farm field. So because of that, uh, we have to be very selective about what fertilizers we use, how we use them, and the frequency in which we use them. So the only way for us to know what our grass plant actually needs is for us to take soil samples. So we'll pull samples periodically. Uh, I usually try and do at least four samples a year. So every two to three months, we go out and we'll collect small amounts from various areas all over our field so that it represents the entire area, mix all those soil samples together, and then we bag that up and we'll take it to our local soils lab here from like where a farmer might only go out and apply fertilizers to their field a couple times a year in a larger quantity. We do small quantities at very frequent, so every two weeks we come out with a very light rate of fertilizer so that we're just spoon feeding a little bit to the plant, a little bit to the plant. Uh, we like for our fertilizer pellets to be a little smaller than normal, just because, so our equipment, the mowers that we use, doesn't disturb it or disrupt it, cut up the prills. The other aspect of using a smaller grain is that we get a more even distribution, and the more evenly the fertilizer is distributed, the more available it is to the plant. Everything that we do, everything, how the grass grows, how it responds to when we fertilize, what we fertilize, is all based on temperature, time of year, sunlight, if there's rain in the forecast, if there's not. Um, so weather is kind of one of those big unknown factors about our job. Uh, and that's, you know, I talk about challenges, that's one of the biggest things, one of our biggest challenges we have. 
So I get to work outside every single day. No two days are ever the same for me um, so that I don't have to worry about getting bored just between the different sports we have and the weather patterns and no two days, no two years. It's never the same. So it's always a new challenge every single day. And um, for me, that's fun having the challenge and something to adapt to and overcome every day and, and learn from and grow as an individual. I always tell people, the only people outside of the athletes themselves and the coaches that can really affect the outcome of our games is us because what we do can actually affect how the game proceeds and plays. So that's a fun component of it. It's a way for me to stay involved in the sport. Essentially, I'm getting paid to watch sports. So what's not to love about that? All right, you know, I thought my job was pretty cool at Discovery Education, but your job is really cool. <laughs> and in all the years that I've been playing sports on turf fields, I never realized how much impact on the game the field can actually have. Yeah, I, I'm very fortunate in the fact that I have a great job and I love what I do. But as you mentioned, yeah, the, the field is critical to the game because um, our athletes, our athletes, our baseball players, our football players, soccer players, softball players, they spend hours a day on our surfaces just practicing and preparing for what they're doing. So they need to know every single day that that surface is gonna be consistent and that it's gonna be safe. So um, we're always evaluating whether it's too soft or too hard, just because we're worried, you know, if the field gets too soft, um, there's always concern that a player could slip or fall and, and hurt an ankle or a knee. Um, and then in the inverse, if the field gets too hard, uh, especially in more of the contact sports where a, a player falls and interacts with the surface, um, we're worried about them falling and hurting themselves somehow. Um, so along that same lines, kind of one of the bigger trends now in our industry, the other thing we have to worry about, and you hear a lot of talk about it nowadays, is concussions. Um, where a player falls down and, well, either players contact each other head to head and they get a concussion, or they fall and their head hits the surface mm -hmm. and they get a concussion. So um, we're actually doing scientific tests to evaluate the surface hardness of a field. So earlier today you saw me using this bright yellow metal cylinder. And what this is, is this is called the Clegg Impact Hammer. Mm -hmm. And what it does is it measures the surface hardness of the field. So what you saw me do is I pick up this weighted missile, I drop it on the field, and it sends a reading to this little box here that gives me a number that I can then correlate to how hard or soft the surface is. So a lower number means a, a certain, there's a number range we work on. Um, so I know with this number, hey, the field's too soft. This number range, the field is perfectly fine. If I get above this number, then the field is too hard. So when we get a reading back from the Clegg that shows that the surface is too hard, there's remedial steps that we'll take to ensure the safety of our athletes. Um, we have machines that, we call, that are called aerifiers. They come in different forms, shapes, sizes. Um, but what we'll do is we bring the aerifier out onto the field. We run it across the entire surface, or if it's just one area that's a problem, we run it across that area and it loosens the soil back up. It's called aerating. Mm -hmm. Loosens it back up, allows water, light, nutrients, and air to infiltrate into the soil a little bit better and it makes it safer for them. Hmm. Well, it's very clear that science is sort of the foundation of all of this monitoring that you're doing of the turf fields. Absolutely, it's essential. Well, thinking back a little bit to the more artistic part of your job, um, we are seeing a lot of results on this poll, which is fantastic. And we uh, it, it looks like the majority of you all think the same thing that I thought, which is that different mowers at different heights would be responsible for those beautiful designs. So tell us, Nick, is that correct? It actually isn't. It's a great <laughs> guess, though. I remember growing up before I learned about what it was, um, that's what I always thought was, oh, they gotta be just mowing at a different heights. Um, what it actually is, is we're taking advantage of the reflective properties of the turf grass blade. Mm. Um, so what we're doing is we have rollers on our mowers to create the stripes. Um, when we do the actual hand designs, like I think we showed a script Aggie, the word Aggie is written in cursive across the outfield of the grass. We actually did all that work with hand brooms and push rollers. And so what you do is you're taking advantage of the reflective property of the grass. So if you lay the grass down so that it's all facing away from the eye, your the way your eye perceives it, is your eye sees the sunlight reflect off the entire leaf surface of the blade. And so you get that light stripe color. And then to get the dark color, I do the exact opposite. I bend the grass over towards you and your eye sees the light reflect off of just the tips of the leaf blades. And so you get that light and dark contrast. Mm -hmm. But so yeah, all the specialty logo work, we actually do all that by hand. Wow. So those of you that picked D, you are correct. This is all done by hand, which is really incredible. And I'm thinking maybe some of the students should tweet in their ideas for what Olsen should have in the outfield next. Yeah, send them in. I'd love to see what we can do. 
Well, we do have a lot of students watching from all over the country, in addition to the lovely students that joined us, and they're asking questions. Okay. Are you ready to field some of their questions? Yeah, let's play ball. <laughs> all right. Um, so Stacy Kunde from Brilliant High School in Brilliant, Wisconsin, wants to know, how do you plan for the weather? That is a great question, Stacy. And to give you the very honest answer, is there's no real way to prepare or prepare for it because it's so hard to predict. Um, and that's one of the things, like, there's so much variable in the weather that basically what I do is I always tell my students, we'll prepare for the worst and we'll hope for the best. So we kind of always have, we come in every single day. The first thing I do when I come in in the morning is I check the weather. I usually check it at lunch. Before I leave for the day, I check the weather. And usually before I go to bed at night, I'm at home pulling it up the weather on my phone or my tablet just to make sure I know what's going on today, tomorrow, the day after. So we always have a plan B, a plan B, or plan A, a plan B, a plan C, um, just in case, based on how the weather's gonna turn out. Yeah, well, having a plan B and C is probably good for just about any career that you're going into, <laughs> so that's good advice. Um, let's see, Anna Henderson from McGee, Arkansas wants to know, do baseball cleats ruin the turf? Another great question. An answer to that, Anna, um, not really. Uh, over the course of time, the baseball cleats can slowly wear on the turf grass, especially if it's in the exact same area every single day, day after day, day after day. Um, so like you might think of like a soccer goal mouth, for example, where the goalie's in the exact same mouth every single day for the entire practice, for an entire game. Um, it's common to over the course of time, you'll wear that down. Now, me as a turf manager, if I'm doing my job properly and I talked about the health of the soil and the health of the plant, um, if we're managing our soil properly and we're managing our nutrients and we've got a healthy, strong plant, grass is amazingly resilient. And so it's remarkable how much wear and tear it can actually hold up to. So if I'm actually doing my job effectively and thoroughly, the grass can actually hold up to anything we throw at it. Well, if you're in charge, I'm sure it's great. I'm sure the grass <laughs> is in perfect condition. Um, and then Owen Spara of Lafayette Mills in Manalapan, New Jersey is asking, how do you make the turf and what is it made out of? Okay, so that's a really great question. Um, we talked early in the show about how today we're specifically talking about natural grass playing surfaces. And at the beginning of the show, I said what that involves is, is we're dealing with millions and millions of plants that are actually all actively growing together and creating this dense turf stand that we're standing on. So essentially, there's a couple different ways. I talked a little bit earlier about how we've got cool season grasses and warm season grasses, and which you use depends on the climate in which we're living in. Mm. So once again, I'll refer to like, if I'm living in a northern climate and I'm using cool season grasses, the majority of them are, are available via seed. So just like any other plant that you might grow in your garden or in the greenhouse or a nursery, I throw the seed out on the field surface, I add water, I add the right amount of nutrients, we get a little bit of sunlight, and bam, a few days to a few weeks later, we have millions and millions of grass plants growing and we have a field. In the south, there's a lot fewer gra or seeded types available of grass um, for what we're doing. So we have to go about it a slightly different manner. Um, we'll take small pieces of the grass plant that are called sprigs, or oftentimes we'll actually take solid chunks of grass, which are called sod, and we'll spread those out over the entire surface. And then same difference over, you add the water, you add the right nutrition, and over the course of a few days to a few weeks, voila, we have a field. Well, you make it sound easy, but to those of us without a green thumb, I'm sure it'd be a little bit more challenging than that. <laughs> but it sounds like regardless, the nutrients play a critical role. The nutrients are essential. I mean, it's just like you or me, we have to feed ourselves every single day to make sure that we're happy and healthy. The same goes for the plants. We have to provide them the nutrients to make sure that they're happy and healthy. Great. Well, Steve Barton is the owner of Bonus Crop Fertilizer, and we're gonna go to him to hear a little bit more about the importance of those nutrients. All plants need three things. They need water, sunlight, and nutrients. Here at Bonus Crop Fertilizer, we supply the nutrients, the nitrogen, the phosphate, the potassiums, the micronutrients, uh, possibly slow release nitrogens. As we add our nutrient values to the sunshine and the water, we get growth on all the plants and, and turf fields around your school. Most turf fields are different from say your backyard. The professionals come in and put in a sand base or sandy loam type soils that percolate very well. That means water goes through that soil extremely fast 
and that deletes the nutrients. Also, the sandy soils like that might not have a lot of uh, organic matter. The big sports fields need a lot of small applications uh, to keep the nutrient level up for them to grow and look as good as, say, Kyle Field at Texas A&M. For us to know what product to produce for the customer, we either have a soil sample that has come back that shows us what is in the soil itself and then how we can put together an analysis that will help cure any major issues and also promote nitrogen, phosphate, and potassium. Another major concern in turf uh, management is particle size of your fertilizer. The smaller the particle size, the more particles you get per square foot. And that becomes important, especially in turf management, when you are putting a herbicide on your fertilizer. So you're getting better coverage on your herbicide to get better results. The fertilizer industry in years past and certainly now have worked diligently to produce environmentally friendly products. The major companies are coming out with some great slow release products where the nitrogen is fed to the plant more as the plant needs it instead of all at once and is not getting into the groundwater runoff. Here at Bonus Crop Fertilizer, we bring our input items, so-called raw materials, in by either rail or by truck. We unload that, put it in different bin spaces in the plant to keep it separated. And then we have a front end loader that moves each product that we need and goes through an elevator system up to where we blend it. And our blender is the guy that looks at the formulation and he puts in X number of pounds of nitrogen, X number of pounds of potassium, and X number of pounds of phosphate, micronutrients, slow release nitrogens, whatever's in the actual analysis that has been sent to the plant. One aspect of the turf management business I've learned that is very, very important is quality. They are not looking so much at price as at quality. Sure, price matters, but the quality, the size of the product, the consistency of the product, the spreadability of the product, means more to them than a few dollars. So we understand that we need to buy certain nutrients from certain people that stand up to this quality. So when we put them together, we have the product that the turf manager wants. Welcome back. Um, I just really want to make sure that I have all of my bases covered. So let me make sure I understand this process. You take a soil sample from your turf, you send it over to Tony in his lab, and from his report, you understand what nutrients and in what quantities you need to apply to the field. So then you're able to put in an order with somebody like Steve's company. He provides the right nutrients, the right quantities, you apply them to the field, and then you kind of just repeat the cycle over and over again, correct? Exactly. It's just a constant cycle of we evaluate the conditions of the field, the soil conditions, the nutrient levels, the weather, and then once again, the condition of the field, then we just basically continue that cycle over and over and over and continue to maintain the surface. Excellent. Um, I do have a few more uh, questions here. If I promise not to throw you any hard balls, do you think you can handle a couple more questions? I'll do my best not to strike out on them, so. <laughs> Don't worry guys, we're almost done. Um, so, Stacy Crouch from Dutch Fork Elementary School in South Carolina asks, are the fertilizers that you're using harming the environment around the stadium at all? Okay, that's a really great question, Stacy. Um, and to answer on it, no. The fertilizers we use, when used properly, are not harmful to the environment in any way, shape, or form. Um, I would actually go to the contrary statement and tell you they're actually benefiting the environment by our use of them because when we responsibly use fertilizers, the right fertilizer at the, in the right quantity at the right time in the right place, when they're responsibly used, they actually create better soils, they create stronger plants, which then as we sh Kirsten showed us with her activities, help filter out things that harm mm. our environment. So the use of the fertilizers actually in the long run benefits our environment. 
All right, let's see one more. Um, Michael Emshaw from Alvin ISD in Alvin, Texas, wants to know how does the pH affect the condition of the turf, and then how do you maintain the pH? Okay, great question. Glad we got one in from Texas here. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I touched briefly on when we talked about the soil test reports, pH being one of the important things that we really pay attention to, um, and that's because it can have such a drastic effect on the plant. Mm -hmm. So, ideally, the ideal pH range for a turf grass is in the 6.5 to 7.5 range on the pH scale. So I talked about in our soil test, we were at an 8.3, which is a little high. So now the reason I worry about that and I want it in that right range is because the pH ultimately has an effect on the nutrient availability to the plant in the soil. So if I get a pH that's too far below that 6.5 range, there's certain elemental nutrients that are essential to the plant that become tied up in the soil and they're held more mm -hmm. tightly and so the plant can't access them as readily. And then the inverse is true as well. So if I get a pH that's too high, too far above that 7.5, we fight the exact same problem only with different nutrients. Um, there's other nutrients that when you get that high scale, they become less plant available. And so we're always trying to balance that middle ground, that 6.5 to 7.5 to make sure the maximum nutrient quantity is available to the plant so that we can have a happy, healthy plant. Now in the instance you said, how do we manage it? Um, if I get too high or too low, there's other nutrient products that we can apply to a field. So if my pH gets too low, too acidic, most soil labs are gonna recommend that I apply a liming product. And over the course of time, that lime product is gonna bring, it's a calcium based product, is gonna slowly bring the pH up and buffer that back up into that 6.5 to 7.5 range. The other side, if the pH is too high, like in our case, we have an 8.3, the common recommendation from the soil lab is to apply either a sulfur product or a gypsum type product. And the same thing, that over the course of time, that's gonna buffer that pH down and slowly bring that number down into the range where we want it. Gotcha. Well, excellent. Unfortunately, that's all the time that we have. Nick has got a lot of fields that he needs to manage, <laughs> so we're gonna let you get back to that. Thank you so much for having us, for telling us all about your job. It's really Thanks. been excellent. Thank you for being here. Well, and thank you to Texas A&M University for hosting us at beautiful Olson Field. Thank you to all of you for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed it. And please make sure you check out thescienceofsoil.com because you can find a ton of free resources, including an archive of this virtual field trip, as well as others. So thank you all so much. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.